pockets. I invite with you, you to participate with us in saying our student pledge the way we start each morning. I pledge allegiance to myself. I pledge allegiance to myself. And who I want to be. And who I want to be. I can make my dreams come true. I can make my dreams come true. If I believe in me. If I believe in me. I pledge to stay in school and learn. I pledge to stay in school and learn. The things I need to know. The things I need to know. To make the world a better place. To make the world a better place. For kids like me to grow. For kids like me to grow. I promise to keep my dreams alive. I promise to keep my dreams alive. And be all I can be. And be all I can be. To make my parents proud to say. To make my parents proud to say. They trust and honor me. They trust and honor me. conversation is a difficult one and I thank you all in advance for discussing this topic in a dignified way that represents the pride of Mark Hopkins. Before I introduce tonight's presenter, I would like to remind everyone that there are interpreters in the back of the room with headsets should you need a headset or interpretation services. We also have child care. For children two through five, they're located in room two, our preschool. The older kids are in rooms 25, 26, 18, and 19. It is my pleasure to introduce our facilitator tonight, Dr. Olive Roberts. Dr. Roberts is our chief academic officer and has led the charge in bringing many wonderful academic programs to our district and our school. Please join me in giving her a well, warm welcome to Mark Hopkins. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Good evening, everyone. As she has said, I am Olivine Roberts and I have the privilege as serving as the Chief Academic Officer for the Sacramento City Unified School District. On behalf of Superintendent Raymond and the Board of Education, I would like to thank you for being here tonight to support your school and your children. I would also like to acknowledge and thank Board Member Rodriguez, I don't know if she has arrived yet, but she is the trustee for this area, and I know she will be coming later as we continue our conversation. I'd also like to thank Superintendent Raymond, he's over here in the corner, for being here tonight. He has to split his time with us and with Fruit Ridge Elementary. We have, this same meeting is taking place at Fruit Ridge, and to honor both communities, he will be leaving this meeting at approximately 7.30. But I want to assure you that your comments and your thoughts will be recorded and your questions will be answered in a timely manner. Now, we know that no one wants to close schools. And we know that these are very difficult discussions and they are very personal. And because we know that this conversation can be emotional and hard, I will be asking you for your assistance tonight during this conversation that the dialogue that we have is one that is of the most um, highly, <laughs> sorry, I didn't see the photographer over there, that is most respectful and will honor the dignity of Mark Hopkins. First, I will start with a brief overview of the district's financial situation that has led to this difficult discussion, decision, excuse me. It will include the right sizing of the district and why it is so critically important, the consequences of not taking action, and lastly, what you can expect during this process. To begin, 
This chart is from the California Department of Education. It shows that our district has lost 5,479 students between the school years 2001-2 and 2011-12. That is approximately 160 classrooms of students. We have lost at least 800 students this year and we're projecting an additional loss of 800 students next school year. Reasons for the decline include the aging of neighborhoods, the lure of new homes in nearby suburbs, and the recession and foreclosure crisis. Now, it should be noted that this is not just taking place in our school district. California in general has declining child population due to lower birth rates and fewer newcomers moving to our state. This chart shows Mark Hopkins Elementary enrollment going back to 1996-97. Mark Hopkins had hit high during the year, my laser isn't working, the first bar, 1996-97, of 646 students. This year, there are 418 students who attend Mark Hopkins Elementary. That is a loss of 228 students, which is equivalent to a percent of 35%, a loss of 35%. As we have said, no one wants to close schools, but we need to match the number of schools we have to the number of students we are serving. We have too many elementary schools that are below capacity. This puts a strain on our resources, on our staff, and it is costing the district a lot of money. Here you can see San Juan Unified has the same number of students, but has 13 fewer elementary schools. They have 43 schools, elementary school, and we have 56. At Grove Unified, which has approximately 1,400 students more than us, has 39 elementary schools. <coughs> Declining enrollment makes our district budget problems worse because our funds from the state are based on the number of students who attend our schools. <coughs> Because of declining enrollment, state cuts caused by the recession and a loss of federal funds, our district has had to face 10 years of budget deficits. That's a decade of cuts to programs, to people, and to services. In the last five years, we've been forced to cut $146 million. Last year alone, we had a $28 million deficit, and we were forced to cut <coughs> teachers, custodians, assistant principals, counselors, librarians, nurses, social workers, maintenance staff, bus drivers, and adult education. <coughs> Frankly, we have run out of places to cut. This graph dramatically illustrates the severity of the cuts over the last 11 years. Since the school year 2002-03, we have reduced our spending by $216 million because of cuts to our funding. Despite years of cutting, we're expecting another significant deficit for the 2013-14 school year because of declining enrollment and rising costs. If we close these 11 chronically underutilized schools, we will save approximately $2.5 million each year. If we don't close these schools, 
our budget will still have to be balanced. So let's take a look again at the cuts that we've already made. Further cuts to people, services will damage the quality of the education that we provide to our students on every campus, every day. We've heard these questions, well, what about Prop 30? What about measures Q and R? I thought they were supposed to save our schools. Well, Proposition 30 saved our district from having to cut an additional $15 million this school year. In addition to that, if Prop 30 had failed, we would have had to cut and end this school year two weeks early. That would have meant that our students would not have received instruction for two weeks, 10 days. We are ecstatic that Prop 30 passed. <clears throat> However, even with Proposition 30, our district still faces declining enrollment, rising costs, and a strain on our resources caused by the operation of too many elementary schools. We are still very likely to have a deficit next year. As for measures Q and R, those bond funds cannot be used to balance the budget. These funds are designated to be used to upgrade and repair your child's new school, as well as the middle and high schools they will eventually attend. So how did your school get on the closure list? This is about our district financial realities. No one wants school districts to make decisions based on finances. But we have to. If we do not deliver a balanced budget to the county every year, we will be taken over by the state. So since we are forced to make this decision based on our financial reality, that we have dwindling funds due to declining enrollment and rising costs, we use a financial criteria in determining which schools should be closed. This is not a judgment on your school, on your principal, on your community. We know you love your school. We know you love your principal, your teachers, and we know you love your community, and you should. The fact is, we simply have more schools than we can afford. The district looked at the capacity and used a formula that I will explain momentarily. Some schools were removed from the list for one of two reasons. Schools whose enrollment will grow from the closure of another school were removed, and priority schools were removed as well. The method we used for determining capacity was to count all teachable spaces in each school, including surplus classrooms that could house students, but were currently being used for such things as child development programs, supplemental teachers lounges, and PE prep rooms, for example. We removed libraries from the tally, and then we calculated the capacity by using the current class size limits, including smaller limits for special education. We used the same criteria to determine capacity at every school. I will repeat that again. It is important that you understand that the exact formula was used at every elementary school district-wide. The same yardstick was measured, was used to measure the capacity for every school. Using this method, we see that Mark Hopkins could serve a maximum of 940 students, 
but serves 418. We have identified two new home schools for the Mark Hopkins students based on address of residence, John Bidwell and John Sloat. Please note, Mark Hopkins families will be given priority in the district's enrollment process. Open enrollment. Thank you. Open enrollment is an opportunity for Mark Hopkins families to have choice and apply for spots in schools beyond your neighborhood and to apply for available seats in specialty programs. Students from schools that are recommended for closure will be given priority during the open enrollment process, which will begin on February 19th and will end on March 8th. Now what do we mean by you having priority? At the end of the open enrollment window, again, which is March the 8th, your children will be placed in a special lottery, available only for you. At oh, there it goes. Okay. All right. All right. Uh -huh. so what can happen to our kids? Okay, I appreciate you being very respectful and demonstrating for our students how we engage in a respectful dialogue. Thank you. Okay, as I was saying, okay, a special lottery will be available for you and other students from schools slated for closure. Then and only then are other applicants from around the district considered for these available seats. This is not, I repeat, repeat, this is not a first come, first safe, first serve process. Placement is completed at the end of the open enrollment process for all applicants who apply, ensuring priority status for the schools slated for closure. If there are more applicants than available seats, students will be placed on a waiting list for their preference school, preferred school, and in the meantime will attend their new neighborhood school. To apply for open enrollment, parents must submit an online application. If you do not have a computer, you're welcome to use the computers that are here at Mark Hopkins. In addition, we will also offer walk-in enrollment registration on March 6th, 7th, and 8th at the Enrollment Center located at 5601 47th Avenue, adjacent to the Cerna Center. For more information, you're welcome to visit the district website. Now, we know that many of you have concerns about getting your child safely to his or her new school. And I want to reassure you that safety of all of our children is the district's number one priority in this process. We are working very diligently with the Sacramento Police Department, with our district safe schools office, and the city of Sacramento to ensure that all children will get to their new schools safely. We're also studying traffic patterns and projections and working with our partners on ways to mitigate any challenges that may arise. In addition, walking attendance will be provided for students going to John Bidwell and John Sloat. We're also working with the city to identify safe routes for getting them to both John Bidwell and John Sloat. Some of the benefits for your children attending a larger school will include fewer split grade classes. Please note, please note that the class size will not increase. Class sizes will remain the same even if the population of the school increases. The class size will not, I repeat, will not increase. Additional benefits are more resources for additional staff 
as well as programs for our students. With more staff on site, staff will have more peers with whom to collaborate and learn. This is a great strategy for improving student learning. With fewer campuses to paint, clean, and repair, the district will be able to provide healthier and safer schools for all of our students. Larger parent communities provide more opportunities for parent and community involvement. We will continue to hold these community meetings like this one until February 19th. On February 21st, the board is slated to take action on this process. <laughs> Following the board action, if the board votes in favor to close the 11 schools, a committee will be appointed to make detailed and thorough recommendations regarding the repurposing and the reuse of the closed facilities. Community input will be a very important part of this process. If the board approves the closure of the schools, we will form both a district-wide as well as a school-level transition team that will work closely with staff and parents to mitigate any challenges and make sure everyone is taken care of during the process. The areas these teams will focus on will include transportation and safety, supporting families, enrollment support, as well as school culture, among other topics. I know that there's a lot of information that I've just shared, so I want to remind everyone that we have handouts in the back, which include the PowerPoint presentation, a report regarding the right sizing process that was used to determine the identified schools, the open enrollment process, and lastly, a set of questions that have already been answered, which I believe will also address some of the questions that you may have tonight. I know that many of you have come to make comments about this decision, and we want to make certain that everyone has the opportunity to be heard. In your comments and your questions, we hope to hear feedback on how we can best support your child and you during this process. We ensure, <coughs> excuse me, to ensure that we respect each other's opinions and time, we're asking everyone to follow some ground rules. One, there are microphones located on both sides of the room. We ask that you line up behind each microphone and we will alternate between them. If you need a Spanish interpreter, I will ask that you line up on your right, my left. If you're in need of a mom interpreter, I will ask that you line up on, did I do that wrong? Let's try that again, I apologize. If you're in need of a Spanish interpreter, please line up on your right, which is my left, which is what I said, right? Yeah. Oh, beautiful, thank you. And if you're in need of a mom interpreter, please line up on your left, my right. Thank you. We ask that you limit your comments to two minutes per speaker to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. We will have a timekeeper at the front of the room that will show when two minutes have elapsed. Please allow everyone an opportunity to speak once before making a second or third comment. <clears throat> if additional comments are um, to be made. We also have the avenue of you using an index card. Um, I see one in the back. So we have index cards for you. You're welcome to complete as many of those that you desire and we will be able to respond to those comments and thoughts as well. Okay. 
I understand that there is a lot to say, but we want to make certain again that everyone has an equal opportunity to be heard tonight. We will provide responses to your questions within the week. So between now and next Wednesday, the district will respond to the questions that are asked tonight. You will notice that we have staff in the front of the room who will be taking copious notes. Also, this entire presentation is being videotaped. This will ensure that we have the opportunity to capture all of your questions and to answer them in a very timely manner. Since this is an emotional topic, I understand and urge you to keep the applause to a minimum. If you would like to do this, this is great and it will expedite the time of us getting as many questions heard. We will end this meeting at 9 o'clock and we're doing that because as you notice we have several students here tonight. It is a school night and we want to ensure that they have a good night's rest so they're ready to engage in a wonderful day of learning tomorrow. So this meeting will end at 11. We will now begin, excuse me. Wishful thinking, wishful thinking, sorry. This meeting will end at nine. We will now begin our public comments. You're welcome to line up if you'd like to make public comments. Okay, as you are gathering, we would like to thank Council Member Bonnie Pinnell for being here tonight. Wherever she is, if she could simply wave. Thank you for being here. your undivided attention so we can hear as each person speaks. So I will ask for your undivided attention.